Hello everyone, welcome to My Born Conspiracy, Assassin Difficulty Walkthrough. This is Mission 9, Disarm Reynard, and compared to the previous mission, which was an absolute clusterfuck mess of a section, and the developers clearly don't understand Jason Bourne the same way true Jason Bourne fans actually understand, this mission doesn't favor anything so stupid, it doesn't favor any stupid gimmicks, it's the traditional Bourne conspiracy gameplay, it's not some stupid destruction derby section that feels so out of character for Jason Bourne, it's building into the strengths of the game, and it's a pretty standard mission. And compared to the other missions, this one encourages stealth a little bit more. There are larger stealth set pieces in this game, and this is one of them. It's the very beginning of the mission. And then there's also one where we do a bit of stealth after we do a mini-boss encounter against that guy right there. That guy running away is the mini-boss coming up. And then we do some pretty fun combat encounters. And this mission has a pretty interesting mechanic to it. This is the only mission in the game where the enemies are actually fighting each other. I mean, unless you count Eliminate the Vandalin, but the times when the police were encountering the enemies, they were simply uh, one-off sequences. They were just scripted moments that only lasted for a couple of seconds, but they weren't really fighting. But here, the enemies will actually fight each other. There are two enemy factions in this mission. There are Renard's thugs, and then there are also uh, Azar's thugs. These are Azar's thugs that we're dealing with, so they're the ones that look like the standard Spetsnaz guy, whereas Renard's thugs are more so the security guards of this place. And once we get to the part where Azar assassinates Renard, that's when the enemies will be fighting each other. That being said though, as is the case with a lot of other games that try to use the whole concept of enemies fighting each other, if you somehow draw attention, or you put yourself in the middle of their gunfire, they will all prioritize you, and they'll act like they're allies when they actually aren't. And this is something that not a lot of games are able to get correctly. And I feel like Resident Evil is probably the only game series where it really got friendly fire for the enemies correct. When the enemies weren't really trying to attack each other, they just ended up accidentally hitting their friends. I can't really think of a single game where the enemies actually attack each other, and it's programmed correctly, so that even when you're in the middle of their gunfire, or you're shooting at them, but they're not directly in their gunfire, they still go out of their way to attack each other, and not just you, and they don't act like allies to each other. I don't know any game that has really good programming like that, when it comes to friendly fire for the enemies. So, while I do appreciate the concept of the enemies attacking each other in this mission, the execution could have been a little bit better. That being said though, it is quite funny how when an enemy kills another enemy, they actually say the quotes that they normally say when they kill you. Like, you'll hear enemies saying, I haven't seen a fight like that since Kabul 85, and I have no idea what Kabul 85 is a reference to, and I've looked it up and it doesn't seem to be a real world event, or maybe it is, but it's just something not easily accessible on the Wikipedia or something. And um, also, they'll say quotes like, we got him, or the American is getting past us, or god damn it. Or one of my other favorite quotes, crazy cowboy American. <laughs> they actually say that when you die. And I wouldn't know how many quotes the enemies have on this game, because I barely die in this game, given how simple it is, once you actually understand how the game works, and when you use the mechanics correctly. But it's quite funny how uh, they didn't even bother changing the quotes up so that the enemies had unique quotes when they finish each other up. They just instead reuse the quotes that they normally say when they kill you. So it's clear that this mechanic wasn't really intended to be a thing in this game. It just sort of became a last minute decision for this mission probably. And it does spice the gameplay up and it definitely makes this past sequence a little bit more interesting than the other missions. But in a very minor sense per se. But we've done that mini boss encounter, we have some minor stealth encounters right here, We're, really it's just one counter right here, and then we have a couple of these enemies. Uh, for some reason the game doesn't start you off with a pistol, you have to pick up this guy's pistol if you want to actually have a weapon. And this is the part where you have to search a bunch of crates, and after you do that, Azar will kill Renard, and that's when the game doesn't embrace stealth anymore, it instead embraces combat. And this initial combat encounter, you need to get it where the enemies will be rushing at you if you stay in cover for long enough. We're going to take advantage of that mechanic again. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to open up with a shooting takedown to take out some of the enemies, just to thin their numbers. And these enemies, they should be fighting each other, but they're all prioritizing me. Like, there are Renard's thugs and Azar's thugs in this section right now, and they're not fighting each other. 
and I'm going to have to rely on this, where I'm going to sit behind this crate and not do anything, because the enemies will push up so long as they have a friend supporting them. But at least in this sequence, the last guy in this encounter, he does decide to push up without a friend. So this section works in allowing you to take advantage of that mechanic, because you need it. These enemies have set up in some pretty powerful positions, and trying to aim out of cover in order to shoot them is pretty dangerous. I mean, right there, I could have easily died. But that guy is basically trying to shoot me. I'm not doing anything, so he's eventually going to push up. I wonder who came up with the idea for this mechanic of having enemies rush you. I bet they realized that just sitting in cover and just waiting for the right moment to attack would just drag out the gameplay. And so to speed up the encounter and to really complement the faster paced nature of the Born Conspiracy, they made it where the enemies will actually try to push up and try to force you out of cover, and also force you into the melee. And maybe that's another reason as well, because the game forces you into melee and you can't escape melee. Having an enemy rush you in cover while other enemies are shooting you can be a detriment. So that's probably why they thought of that mechanic. But if that's the case, that right there is pretty scummy if you ask me. <laughs> but this is where you'll really notice the enemies attacking each other, and they're saying all the quotes that they normally say when you kill an enemy or they kill you. And they said, like, the American is getting past us when none of these guys are American. I'm the American here. So why are they saying those quotes? I don't know. But try to fight this guy in melee combat so that you can get some adrenaline back. And try to stay away from the railing when you're busy dealing with this guy. You do not want the enemy shooting you. Although these guys, for some reason, are just standing around, not really doing anything. And this is where I should be using the Born Instinct mode to track these enemies. There's one guy. And then the last two enemies in this part right here are just standing so close to each other. And I get a headshot on that guy, and then I get another headshot on that guy. And we go down the stairs, I'm going to grab the... Actually, no, I'm not going to grab the shotgun, what am I thinking? Just stick with the assault rifle, even though the assault rifle is pretty bad in this game. Compared to the submachine gun, the assault rifle is pretty useless. But you're going to push up to this piece of geometry over here. The door is going to blow open, and a bunch of enemies are going to rush you. Uh, you can use your adrenaline in this part right here, but bear in mind, there is a mini-boss encounter coming up, and there are two enemies that will engage in melee combat with you while the mini-boss is shooting you. And you'll only engage in melee combat with the mini-boss once you finish off the two enemies that are attacking you. And you're in some pretty close quarters when you are in that mini-boss encounter. So the mini-boss has the perfect opportunity to capitalize on your inability to escape from melee combat in order to shoot you when you're dealing with those two enemies. So before you go up to the top floor of this area, you need to make sure that you have at least two bars of adrenaline so that you'll be able to finish off the two enemies in melee combat easily and not be shot at by the mini-boss. And that right there, was that guy moving while I was in the slow motion mode? Because how on earth did he get so close to me? When I first started my shooting takedown, he was right near the low piece of cover right in front of me. And then somehow he's over there after I finished my shooting takedown. So can the enemies actually move when you're in those shooting takedown moments? That's quite surprising. But we're thinning the herd, but I'm making sure that I get rid of the enemies down below. I save at least one enemy, and then that guy I need to get rid of, and then there should be uh, the last guy right over here. He goes into cover, which gives me an opportunity to ambush him while he's in cover in order to engage in melee combat with him. Generally, this is not the best idea, because normally what happens is when you rush enemies in cover, they will get off the cover and start shooting you. But I guess what happened there was he was kind of in a cooldown period where he has to wait a bit before he starts shooting you. And so that's why I was able to get the drop on him. And once I finished him off and gotten some adrenaline, I'm just going to skip to this mini boss encounter. So that right there is the reason why you need uh, at least two tiers of adrenaline, because those two enemies will attack you while this boss is shooting you. And now that I've dealt with them, we can engage in fisticuffs with this guy. And the mini bosses all work the same way, where you can just kick him with your light kicks repeatedly. And they generally block after you do the third light kick. Uh, that right there, I'm trying to make sure that I go into this counter moment right here so that I can reset him so that he's going to be susceptible to this loop. So watch, three kicks, he blocks, I'm going to kick him again, and it's just three more kicks, and then repeat the process. It's normally after five kicks that the enemies choose to do the takedown against you, so you just got to prepare for that. And yeah, we can build up adrenaline, and you'll definitely need this adrenaline for the upcoming sequence because there are a lot of enemies coming up. And I had actually died twice on this mission in the very final part where you go up the stairs and it triggers a cutscene. But what I was originally trying to do was shoot the enemies that were right by the staircase that triggers the cutscene, but it wasn't working. And I died once on that part. And then the next part, I just tried to rush right to the staircase, but I ended up dying. Uh, you gotta make sure that the final part of the sequence when you are trying to rush towards Azar, 
you pick the right opportunity to run so that you don't have to deal with the enemies, but at the same time, they won't kill you when you're rushing to the staircase. But you understand what I mean when I get to that part. And this guy is taking a beating right now. This is what I mean when I say, when you're not doing takedowns, these mini-bosses just go on and on and on. They have so much life. Uh, I try to do the heavy kick for whatever reason because I just reverted back to the old mentality for whatever reason. And with how much this guy is just taking a beating from these kicks, I just decide to do the takedown against him. And it, it should be about a couple more kicks or just one more takedown in order to finish him off since I've dealt a lot of damage to him. And he's going to go down in a couple of seconds and then we can finally get on with the uh, shootout moment. So just to go on a brief tangent, I recently did a poll on my YouTube channel and I asked people what next PS3 game they would like to see on the channel, and I gave them the options of Batman Arkham Origins and Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions. And with just 13 votes, 85% uh, of people wanted Batman Arkham Origins, and I knew they were going to pick Batman Arkham Origins, but I just wanted to have that reassurance that they wanted me to do uh, Batman Arkham Origins, because I was also interested with doing uh, Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions, because Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions doesn't get a lot of YouTube content, it seems. And it's funny because Stan Lee actually had involvement in that game and he was even partaking in interviews for the game and he liked the whole idea of there being like a multiverse of Spider-Man that are actually playable. So you get to play as four different Spider-Man. I mean, Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions isn't that good of a game. It's a pretty mediocre game at best. It does have some bugs and the combat on that game is not very good. It does have problems. But I have been thinking that when I do my Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions walkthrough, I'm going to put restrictions on it. Because I was actually able to beat Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions uh, without using any upgrades. And admittedly, I don't recommend you do that. The game is much better with the upgrades. But a large percentage of the game can be done without ever having to slot into upgrades. But you don't really get a lot of the uh, flexibility of the combat. You don't get a lot of combat options at your disposal that actually uh, diversify the combat a little bit more. So that's why I don't recommend you do it. And plus, certain sections are just grueling and badly designed. If you don't slot into the upgrades, if you don't get in any health upgrades, like if you don't flesh out the gameplay, th it's clear that the sections are going to fall apart. Like The sections are designed with the full entirety of the combat at your disposal. But the thing is, is that I just decided to do a no upgrade run of Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions and it kind of worked, but certain encounters were absolutely horrible. They were really bad and the final third of the game is where a lot of these problems really showed themselves. And it's when you do certain missions like Juggernaut's mission, Juggernaut's mission, and when you're dealing with uh, Silver Sable Slugs. When you're, when you're not using any upgrades, the combat really showcases its holes a lot more. And I was dying so many times, and it was just getting really, really un annoying and really irritating because of these problems. But again, unlike Seraphim 17, if I was doing a stupid run of a game, I wouldn't be using such phrases that would be on par with saying, oh, this is objectively a bad thing. It's, it's not that the game is objectively bad, it's just the playstyle that I'm favoring for Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions is a playstyle that is not built into the fundamental foundation of the game. And it's clear it wasn't intended to be as such, which obviously makes a lot of sense. But I'm not going to be like Serpent 17 and just say it's objectively bad because I don't know why he would ever use such words and phrases that are befitting for objective flaws in the game when he's doing a very stupid run of a game that is not built in the foundation of the game. And I noticed this several times when he was doing his Batman Arkham Asylum no upgrade walkthrough and he was also putting other stupid restrictions on himself for that walkthrough and calling the game badly designed and really an annoying like that when you have no right to say those kind of words or those kind of phrases if they don't fit the foundation provided by the game. Like when I'm talking about issues in a game, I always make sure to address those issues in the context of a run that is befitting for the game. That's why I'm able to talk about the objective flaws in Resident Evil Village, or talk about a lot of the great designs in the Evil Within on Akumu difficulty with no upgrades. So I don't know why Seraphim 17 at times can behave like Tynar, that we all know how stupid Tynar is when he's calling certain restrictions skillful, when they're so far below the baseline and they feel so alien, and it's like, how can you possibly think this? That's like thinking that this broken house that is built on a shaky foundation is going to be serviceable to the public. I wouldn't want him designing my house, that's for sure, if he has such a draconian and alien interpretation on what he actually views as being perfectly serviceable for a game. 
And Seraphim 17 expresses that mentality to a much greater degree compared to how he was in the past. And it's just such a bad change on his part. But going back to my main tangent, I'll most likely be doing the no upgrade walkthrough of Spider-Man Shire Dimensions, but I'll always make sure to address that you shouldn't be doing this run the way I'm doing it. And I know it seems kind of strange, given that I vowed never to do these kind of runs, but there's something uh, appealing about the whole idea of no upgrades and Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions, even if it's badly designed in certain parts, so stay tuned for that. But this is the end of this mission. Thank you all for watching, and you take care now.